what did you want to be when you grew up? I, I think like a lot of young people, I kind of went through all sorts of different ideas of little things I, I kind of wanted to do. Um, I've got to admit, I'm a big fan of trains. I grew up in Devon going to steam railways. I can remember being about, I don't know, six, seven years old and going onto platforms with a little whistle and asking the guard if I could, you know, can I, can I set the train off and being really excited at kind of, you know, just being a, a little microcosm of, of that world. And I remember when I was at uh, school, you know, back when connections was a thing and they, they sat you down and said, we want to talk about your career, but I was just at the beginning of the computer age or something. So we've got this really exciting on interactive piece of software. So you put in all the things that you think you're good at and we'll come back and, and, and let you know. And ironically, one of the suggestions on there was academic, but it was the answers that came up with didn't necessarily make sense. I think it was like, you know, I think there was academic teacher and then something like road maintenance worker and you're there going, that's. Though don't feel like there's a, a common thread linking them, but I'm really glad <laughs> I did that, that piece of software. But I, I think if I'm completely honest, I didn't have a single point in my life in my childhood where I went, this is what I want to go on and do. It's just a career I want to, to have. I think like a lot of people when I'm kind of going through that developmental phase, I had some things that excited me, but actually the idea of a working life just is was so different to what I thought it would be when I was, when I was a kid. And I, I grew up, my, my mom was a teacher. My dad was a dentist. My dad's side of the family were a family of dentists. My grandfather mm. was a dentist. And I was the first person in my generation on my dad's side of her family, not to be really pressured to become a, a dentist, not so sort of overbearing family pressure, but perhaps just an mm. expectation with my dad. Was yeah, yeah. Well, of course, of course yeah. you'll be a dentist. Yeah. And on my mum's side of her family, a very military history. I have, you know, my grandfather, like most people of my grandfather's age, fought in the Second World War, but he'd been in the army before the war and remained in it afterwards. He was an armorer. And I've got a, a great, great uncle who uh, was involved in the Indian mutiny. And now I'm sort of 15 years down the line. That's less glamorous than it sounded to me when I was a, yeah. a teenager, but kind of, you know, th there were family stories that kind of. I'm going to like say the heroic things that he did, and I'm going to quantify that by saying it was specifically about saving a ship which started, which caught on fire whilst they were in the sea. So heroics mm. that I'm aware of were more kind of preservation of life rather than all the other bits of the Indian mutiny, which are perhaps less likely to be described as heroic today. Yeah. So I, yeah, ultimately I found myself as kind of a first person on both sides of my family and a couple of generations who maybe hadn't had this expectation on certainly the first male in my family in both generations who had an expectation of this is what you're going to do. Mm. Um, so kind of like most people, I left school and then got a job and worked for a year and thought, well, this is really difficult. I'm going to go off to university. And, and then I became an adult and then I was no longer a young person. So, um, <laughs> yeah, I've, I've not, I've not chased my dreams apart from the occasional sitting down and playing railway simulator yeah. there's, there's, there's very little chasing of my dreams. Did you, when you got in that first job, what, what did mm. you end up doing there? So my very first job was a newspaper delivery boy. Right. Very first know. job. And I worked in a, you know, worked in a, in a market selling, selling food. My first proper full-time job, uh, was a dishwasher in my mum's favorite cafe. And I mm. applied for a job and hadn't been successful because I had no real experience of working in cafes. So I left school and did that really awkward thing where you, you're not working. So you just watch TV all day and then watch TV all night. And it, they reached a stage where I could tell you both the time, but Dave TV, the, the channel stopped broadcasting and when it started broadcasting again, <laughs> and then they had a, a, like two or three staff quit at the same time. So he gave me a call and said, look, we just need someone to come in and wash dishes. We're desperate. Can you come and do it? And I was like, all right, here we go. I'm an, I'm an adult now. <laughs> And so I go into this, this cafe and it's a really great place. I really love the owners there. It's a lovely cafe and kind of work there. Just literally, you know, moving plates around, washing them, mm. smile on my face, kind of helping with the orders. Mm. And they just opened up a pizza restaurant and I am a human. So I like pizza for me. That's kind of a, it's a natural part of being a human. So I was like, oh my goodness, you've got a pizza oven with like you know, proper door that folds down and there's the stone. Can I come and make my own pizza? And I'm like, oh, sure. Yeah. Like knock, knock yourself out. So I go and make my own pizza. I put it in and I'll 
you know, when you're sort of 18 years old, the idea of making food by yourself. God, how exciting is this? I made a meal. Wow. <laughs> and then they uh, had a, a, a booking for an evening and I had like a whole lot of people coming in. And like, Just need someone else to help us with a topping company. Can you come in and help us? So I accidentally became a chef. Uh, mm. We've kind of no experience or no training. You know, I'm a pizza chef, but still I ended mm. up doing all sorts of baking and food preparation and yeah. kind of had an opportunity to experiment with food um, and, and try different things and learn that you can just have a whole load of fun. You don't have to follow for recipe line by line. You can mm. make it up. And that was uh, like a really interesting experience. And I kind of loved working there, but after a year I was thinking, well, do I want to spend the rest of my life? I, I've, I've done everything in this place I will be able to do. I don't mm. particularly want to go and become a professional chef because that feels like really hard work and really stressful, but yeah. I, I need to change unless I, otherwise I'm just going to stay here forever and made the decision to, to go to university. But to this day, we've got a special event, get the, get the flour out, get the water, make my own dough, mm. cook pizza. I'll take it in sometimes for people I, I work with. When we, when we got married, we had pizza as our, as our meal. Mm. Um, so yeah, I learned a lot doing that. Um, and working in a restaurant and getting to know your owners, seeing their struggles was a really interesting experience. Mm, mm. Cause I, I was thinking, well, uh, the reason I wanted to stay with it, just sort of explore the kind of, you know, it's, it's that, do you know what you want to do now? Kind of thing It's like, mm. it's there, were there certain things at certain points that were kind of like dream jobs for you, or were you just kind of, it wasn't really where your focus has, has been. Because I think for some people, it's just kind of like, especially for me, for a good few years and early on in my career, I'm just like, well, this, these are just jobs, you know, like I'm going to mm. be a filmmaker, like, you know, I don't yeah. really care what I do so long as I like the people and I'm not doing anything that's too, you know, terrible. I, I think I've been really lucky to have some kind of incredible friendships and incredible experiences in my life. And... I kind of learned from quite an early age, even sort of post-graduation, even probably before graduation, that work is not the be all and end all. And there are some people who are absolutely driven, you know, I want to be a lawyer, I want to be a doctor, I want to, this is the career I want to do, I want to make that a part of my personality. Mm -hmm. And I kind of realized that wasn't for me, I would rather find a way of doing things outside of work that I wanted to enjoy. Work was always kind of means to an end. And yes, I want to do a job that feels like it's making the world a bit of a better place. I don't want to be a banker and get mm. paid loads of money. Mm. But I also want, I don't want to be consumed by, by work because, yeah. you know, no one ever sits on their deathbed and goes, man, I've only got to stay in the office till 8.15 that day rather than 8 <laughs> o'clock. Like those are the things that we look back on and, I remember recently reading a piece of advice. Uh, there was this law student who was about to graduate and they wrote to a load of senior kind of law partners and say, I'm just about to go into law. And I really want your advice about the things I should do. And what can I do to make the most out of my time? And there's one partner who, who writes back to him and says, you know, you've prompted me to think about my career and I, I wish I'd never gone into law because this person's parents, much like my grandparents had, or my great grandparents to kind of encourage their child, you're going to go into law and you're going to do it. And you're going to succeed. And he had just been on that treadmill his entire mm. life and mm. been pushing himself to earn loads of money and do all sorts of lawyery things. I don't quite know. And he kind of got to the other side. I just didn't enjoy it. I hated it from day one, but it's what I was expected to do. And once I'd started, the idea of stopping felt too difficult. And so the advice was remembering that life is more than what you do between nine and five. And if you're not enjoying that, mm. take a step back and do something else. And it's terrifying, but there's this incredible world we live in and mm. It's better to try new things and to have regrets. You are listening to Series 4, Episode 1 of Working Hours and to my guest, Anthony Butcher. This is another Zoom interview recorded on the 7th of February, 2023. Hey up, so points arising. This is a long one. We go off topic. It gets a bit political. No surprise there then. I have two things to say on this. Firstly, Leeds is a Remain city, so we're biased. Or at least my sample is obviously going to be. Second, if you disagree with anything said, don't hate the show. Come on the show. Tell your own story. 
The quality is a bit meh on this at points, but the discussion should keep your attention. Again, don't hate the show, pay for it to make it better. There will be more episodes and stuff soon. Stay tuned for that. Next episode should be Monday, as usual, same Leeds time, same Leeds channel. There's no normal intro and outro on this one, so this is the closest I have got to making the show as I originally envisioned it. But you need an intro of some sort. So, Anthony Butcher works at the University of Leeds in student support. He is passionate about positive mental health and supporting students to get the most out of their studies, not just academically, but also personally. Anthony believes that it's important to create a society where it is normal to talk about mental health and the challenges we face each day. In 2022, Anthony cycled across America while sharing his personal mental health journey with thousands of people around the world via social media, ultimately raising £30,000 for charity. Remember, listener, there's five main ways you can support any podcast and the more of these you can do, the better for the shows you like. Follow, listen, share guest donate loiners get your ass on this show and then get to your friends and neighbors on it too okay let's do this episode 81 of working hours with anthony butcher what is it that you do now so uh i'm one of those people that has a job title that doesn't say what i do uh, so okay. i'm an assistant school education service manager at the university of leeds uh, and what that means, I work at the University of Leeds. I work in two academic schools, the School of Music and the School of Performance and Cultural Industries, so the School of Theatre and, and Drama. Mm. Uh, and I work in the team of administrators who support all of the student education, so who deal with uh, uh, examination and assessment and quality assurance and student support. And I help manage that team, uh, so I'm mm-hmm. the assistant manager of that team. But what I do mostly day to day is I do student support. So I'm not a qualified therapist or counselor, but I'm a first point of call for students who are struggling, whether they've been bereaved or have mental health issues, or they've got a disability or they're just struggling for a place I can come and have a chat, Mm. uh, talk about what's going on. And I can help signpost them to all of the support that's available within the university and across Leeds, across the UK. And I get to do lots of really fun stuff to help them settle in, like having a yeah, helping plan our welcome week activities and mm. giving students peer mentors, um, and just trying to be a friendly face to make it easy for students to reach out if they're struggling. Mm. Yeah, we'll go straight into how you got into it. So how did you get into it? Uh, entirely by accident. Uh, I had a mental health breakdown in 2017. Mm. Uh, I started what should have been my dream job working for an international human rights charity and through no one's fault, I was in the wrong place at the wrong time and found myself as the only employee of this charity in the United Kingdom uh, and discovered that kind of loneliness, isolation and working mm-hmm. from home four days out of five really isn't good for my mental health uh, mm-hmm. and kind of really got to a very difficult place, place where I had suicidal ideation and was just struggling to see anything positive in the world. Uh, and obviously things got better and I found a way to create some, some purpose. I was actually in San Francisco and kind of came up with a realization I had to do something being, I had to find a way to reclaim who I was and started planning my life for, around that. Uh, but then I started temping at the University of Leeds and started seeing people every day and just, you know, the most basic data entry job, kind of a temporary worker, seasonal, just, you know, taking emails, putting it into spreadsheets. And, but I started speaking to people and feeling better and started applying for different jobs at the University of Leeds where I'd worked before. And generally it's a fantastic place to work. Mm. Um, and then got a whole load of interviews, uh, which was exciting. And then went to those interviews and in a really British way, ended up feeling very awkward when I got offered free jobs within the space of like an hour and a half. <laughs> we actually been, I'd been doing this temp job and we went for our, uh, sort of end of temp job meal in revolutions in central Leeds. And I sat there and on the way down, I got the first phone call. And when the starter arrived, I got the second phone call and when the, when the main arrived, I got the third phone call. It was really awkward going and everyone else there was like trying to get jobs and wasn't having much luck. And I was like, oh, hark. I just had my first, <laughs> had my first job offer. <laughs> but I, I went into those interviews, you know, feeling out for lucky that I've quite a few interviews now. Yeah, I, like I was going to say, I hope you got to enjoy that for a little bit some at some point. Oh, yeah. And it's you know, like, it's a very British awkward form of, you know, enjoyment. Like, you know, it was like, oh, no, no, I'm really successful. Awkward, but, but, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And like genuinely the thought went from my head of, I don't want 
I don't want to disappoint people by saying no. Maybe I can just take all three and just work 24 hours a day. And I was like, no, I, I, could I do two? I'm like, no, no, you don't want to work all the time. There's more to life than that. But in those job interviews, you know, they ask you a whole lot of questions and they get to the end and they say, is there anything you want to ask us? And I think there's often an assumption that asking a really good question there can, can help your, your chances. And you know, as someone who's now done loads of job interviews on the interview panel, it doesn't really make a huge, you know, we score people on those questions. Yeah. But I went into it and said, yeah, I've, I've just had a, a mental health breakdown. I was unemployed because of a bad work situation. Yeah. Why should I come and work with you? Yeah. And the job I chose was a place where the interview panel were almost tripping over themselves to say, actually, we're a really supportive environment. We're really kind. It's so great that you said that. I didn't even realize it was a student support job when I applied for it. It was only when I started the job and they were saying, oh, you're going to go off and help students. I was like, oh, right. I didn't kind of realize that that one line in the person specification will be a huge part of my job. Mm. Uh, and I think what's, so it was, it was very much by accident. It was, you know, a mental health breakdown, apply for a, you know, get a temp job, apply for jobs at the point my temp job is ending, ask that question. And I've just been really lucky to fall into this incredibly supportive team and have a manager who is incredibly supportive for me and my mental health and created an environment where if I'm struggling and there's challenges, I can just say straight up, here's what's going on. and know that yeah. I'm going to be supported. And if I need to take a bit of a step back for a half day or work on stuff that's less intense, so I'm better the next day, I'll be supported to do that. Mm. And it just so happens that that job involves supporting students. And that has been hugely rewarding for me because it's incredible to be able to use some of my own lived experience and mm. to show other people the kindness that I've had shown to me mm. and watch them grow and develop and gain confidence and understand how to cope with mental health and speak to professionals and get their support and, you know, get them graduated. I've been incredibly lucky to go to graduation ceremonies and mm. have, have the students that go, mum, dad, come out. This is the guy who made sure I finished my degree. I wouldn't have done it mm. without him. And that's just so incredibly rewarding, mm. but there was no planning whatsoever. And it kind of means I'm really ironically able to say, you know, I hated my mental health breakdown. Don't recommend it zero out of five, but mm. if I hadn't have had that, I wouldn't be where I am now. And it actually ended up being a really good thing for me in the long run. Mm. 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 So, um, let's go into COVID. Yeah. Because it obviously through lockdown and, and so on and post lockdown, uh, mental health has become a, a, a huge, big issue. And it was mm. sort of, I mean, it was, it was sort of around, it was a growing kind of thing and mm. in, in, in people's consciousness at the time, but I mean, well, that, we'll go into that later, I suppose, but, but like, yeah, take us through your journey into lockdown. So you were working at the university, I assume at that point, were you in the role that you're in now? Yeah. So I'd been in that role, uh, I think about a year and a half, two years by this point. So I had some kind of management of a, of a small team or a system management of a small team. And then my role is kind of really interesting. I'm not an academic, but I play I have a really interesting role where as well as doing one-to-one -one student support for people who are struggling, I'm able to help shape the school community for our welcome activity, for our student voice and get to those student reps. You know, and I used to do things like, you know, run a little Facebook page for all of our students and I could share information. And I think like a lot of people, when we think back to kind of COVID happening, it, it wasn't this kind of, right, this is going to happen. How do we deal with it? It was mm -hmm. kind of like falling down the flight of stairs and realizing halfway down, oh, this is happening now. And actually, I remember, you know, kind of two or three weeks before we were locked down and we were hearing about it in China and the news is kind of following a coach load of people had flown back from China and kind of, you know, that like helicopters are following these people. And I remember, um, having a, a student had been to China, had come back to the UK and was staying in the halls of residence and the hall of residence was saying, stay in your room. We don't want you to come out. And you know, we, we took advice from the university. We're like, well, you cannot like confine someone there to their quarters. Mm you cannot do this. And she was like, no, no, it's fine. And we're like, no, you, we, we cannot force you. We cannot <laughs> quarantine you. And we're kind of re, you know, as treating someone really senior in the university, so we need to contact these halls and say, don't lock the student in their room. And just yeah. in the back of my head going, I really hope that this doesn't come back to bite me. Like, wouldn't it be ironic if like we have a massive global pandemic and then out of nowhere it, it happened. Um, and I remember I've been, uh, I think like a lot of employers, there's kind of a lot of hesitancy. And then when they said they were going to lock down, it was all, well, it'll be in two or three days. 
And everyone was like, well, why aren't we doing this now? And there's a lot of confusion. We're trying to work out what's going on. And a lot of my work at that time was before the country was locking down. I support students who have uh, disabled students. Um, mm-hmm. And we have a lot of students who were immunocompromised, who are very anxious about this. And so I spent a lot of time kind of reaching out, right? Who are all of our immunocompromised students? Sending an email to all students. To, if you have any particular health concerns about this, let me know and kind of negotiating mm-hmm. with individual model leaders, right? This person's not going to come to lectures, but can they watch the lecture captures and agreeing with the school? Yep. And I think being slightly ahead of the curve of let's just not put someone in a situation that, mm. that doesn't seem unfair. And then I think there was this Wednesday afternoon or Wednesday morning and the week that the university was going to close, I was giving a school talk in Otley and I had a, a colleague, um, who, who had a car, I didn't have a car at the time, but I was thinking, well, we're going to get my, you know, going to be, go- it's clear we're going to be going home and I don't have a office chair. Mm. I don't have a. No, that was like a monitor. So I asked my colleague, can you just come and pick me up today? I just kind of turned up, you know, and I worked in two different offices and, uh, had to get some stuff from my wife. So I had like two chairs and two monitors. And I thought, I think I take all my plants cause they, you know, there's a couple of weeks they might not survive. Mm. And, and I got home and I got a text from the, t- uh, the, the friend I have who works in the school saying someone who was at the top today has had a bit of a cough. And I just thought, all right, let's just be safe. I'm just going to stop now. And that was it. I did go in the office for another year, just this, you know, my colleagues had another day or two, and I was one of the very lucky ones that had my screen. And then the following Monday, we didn't have a playbook for this. We mm. didn't have, you know, here's what we do in the event of COVID. I'm sat there on my computer. I've got Ed to schools emailing, emailing me saying, <laughs> you know, have we got students who are going to be able to get home? Have we got students who are trapped in Leeds? And mm. we, we had a student who was in quarantine and they tested positive for COVID and they were in quarantine in Hong Kong. and. They, they couldn't do their work and they couldn't meet their deadlines and we didn't know if they were going to be okay. And suddenly they're going, well, all of the things you were thinking you're going to do, just go out of the window. You're starting mm. completely from, from scratch. Mm. And one of the things that I think I was really lucky to, to have was I work in quite a small school for, for the University of Leeds, mm. so probably a couple of hundred students in, in each mm. school, a little more, a little less, but they're not, you know, a thousand people, 2000. Yeah. Yeah. And from the get go, we had a really strong approach to our, our student voice and our communications. And we tried very hard to phrase things, not as it's all under control. It's going to be okay. Our communication is yeah. a lot more, we are doing our best, but we are a group of humans with our own problems, our own challenges and our own worries. Let us know if things are working and we will do our best to help you. But mm. and like I said, but we don't have a playbook and we were very yeah. open with our students about that. And what ended up happening is we had a really good kind of relationship with our students. Of course, there are people who are kind of frustrated and unhappy, but there were other places in our university and other universities where students are kind of writing petitions saying, we don't know what's going on. No one's talking yeah. to us. Yeah. And we kind of had this very open dialogue. And I remember, um, spending some time on our, we had a school Facebook page. I'd go up for every couple of days and just post something fun. You know, here's a picture of my cats on the bed. Let's see your cats. I'd love to see your cats. What's going on for you or. Here's a picture of me playing train simulator. Yes, I know. I understand. It's really <laughs> weird, but this is one of the things I do to look after myself. What do you do to look after yourself? And people would kind of comment and share and just create this sense of, of community and kind of being able to turn the situation into one in which everyone was in this together from, you know, the first year study abroad students who've just arrived for one semester to the head of school who's mm. been in the school for 15, 20 years mm. and that was kind of a thing that, that kept me going. Mm. You know, we've already kind of ascertained. I had a mental health breakdown in 2017 mm. Mm. because of isolation and mm. loneliness and not speaking mm. to people. Uh, I remember kind of when COVID lockdowns probably came, just messaging my boss on teams or whatever, and just going, right. So I have been to this place before, and this is not a place that goes well for me. Mm. But what was really interesting for me or positive for me because I'd been to that place, I knew for warning signs to look out for. And I remember saying to a lot of people at the time, actually, thank goodness I had a mental health breakdown in 2017. Cause as we went mm. in lockdown in 2020, I was able to notice at times that I was feeling overwhelmed and stressed, mm. depressed and take action. And maybe I'd go and have a longer walk at lunchtime, but mm. come back the next day feeling better rather than pushing mm. myself to work at a time when I was struggling and then needing to take a longer period of time off. So actually that mental health breakdown turned out to be a, a blessing in disguise because it let me understand how I work. Mm, it's that, you know, uh, the Lord moves in mysterious ways kind of thing. 
<laughs> it was like, <laughs> this, this is really awful, but now it's serving me. Yeah, absolutely. And it's up. I really hesitate to say that kind of everything happens for a reason or we are no, yeah, yeah. things. Because, yeah. you know, not everything happens for a reason. There's a lot of stuff that's really terrible out there. And, mm. But all I can say is that for myself, if I hadn't had this, if yeah. I hadn't been through that terrible experience, I don't know how I would have coped with, with COVID. My mum has multiple sclerosis. I've done a lot of charity fundraising for the MS Society. My mum lives in a nursing home. Mm. Uh, COVID was not a good time to be a resident in a nursing home. You can't go and visit and you start hearing mm. scare stories. Mm. It gets in a nursing home and it, and it travels to mm. everywhere. And you, you, there are stories coming out of nursing homes with kind of 50% mortality. And I remember thinking, mm. this is terrifying. Mm. Mm. And if I hadn't been through what I've been through before, I don't know how I would have coped with that. And I suppose for your job, um, like that gave you, you know, that's given you a layer of insight and empathy as well. Like you can sort of pass that knowledge on and you can support other colleagues that are going and students that are going mm. through sort of similar things and just say, you know, these, these are the things that help me, or these are the warning signs or just like, mm. I know, you know, like, yeah, I get it. So, yeah, absolutely. And I'm a really big, you have to be I think, very careful kind of working around mental health, not to kind of say, I have been in this exact situation. Yeah. Yeah. But I think kind of being able to go to people and think using my own experiences to give people permission. So there are times where I would, you know, share whether it was through kind of social media or for emails or for videos and just kind of say, actually, you know, like a lot of people I'm struggling at the moment and here's what's going on. And I'm saying that because I need you to know if we talk about mental health and we talk about, this is something that it should be normal to talk about. Mm. That requires people who are in a position of or do you want to call it authority or leadership or just visibility to model load behaviors? Because if we just consistently say we should talk about how we're feeling as an abstract thing mm. and get us anywhere. And mm. so I, I was kind of very keen to use my experiences and say, you know, I'm doing, this is what's going on for me and I'm doing my best, but I'm, I'm struggling. Um, mm. you need to know that if you come and speak to me, you're speaking to another human being and I might not have solutions, but we can chat about what's going on and talk mm. about what the next steps might be. And, I'm kind of really lucky to be in a position where I know I had students come up and say, look, I heard you talk about this and I need, you know, it made me think I need to come and have a chat with someone. Okay, great. And we can mm. start putting a plan in place and those people get support when, when they need it. And it's something that I'm really passionate is the idea of kind of using whatever platform we all have to be a part of that change of making, talking about mental health normal. Mm. Mm. Uh, well, we'll stay with COVID because I also want to look at sort of changes coming out of that. I mean, were you in a position, I mean, it must have been an awful kind of thing of like, oh God, going back into working at home for you. Mm. I, I mean, are you, back, obviously, I, I'm assuming you're in the office now. So are I'm you, in my home office. Office at home, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, my, my spare bedroom. Uh, just, just out of camera sight is all of the... Uh, furniture and accoutrements and sofa pillows as we do a bit of work at home but we actually we actually moved in december 2020 so like a lot of people when lockdown first came and it kind of it was a glorious summer and i think yeah. you know i'm really intrigued to see how in five years 10 years 20 years 30 years we'll look back on COVID because it's a time of huge stress and for a lot of people such a calamitous experience bereavement and serious illness mm. in some ways it was a real lovely time yes <laughs> Suddenly I went from kind of commuting 10 hours a week to not commuting and having that mm. and right at the beginning of COVID, everyone suddenly had this like burst of energy of, well, if I'm not commuting, I'll do something else instead. So we went for a walk every single day and discovered all sorts of lovely places near where we live. Mm. We kind of did up a house and we kind of, you know, ordered Wix delivery after kind of a 45 minutes phone wait to, to get, <laughs> you know, get some paint delivered and mm. had kind of contractors come and do some work in a different room to us made the house look absolutely lovely and then went, all right, it's never going to look this good again, this good again, quick, sell it now before we ruin it and, <laughs> you know, move to a place of even more green space, which is something that's really important to, to my wife yeah. and I. And, you know, moving in the middle of COVID, the experience in itself, but the day, you know, it was very clear that we were going to be able to find a moving company to move us in the timescale that we needed to. So we, we literally hired a four transit van and moved all of our stuff over two days, like rang the owner of the house we were buying, like, can we come and move the stuff in a day early? Cause you've moved mm. out. 
because we mm. cannot move all of our stuff in a day. And just my wife and I, just the two of us, carried every piece of furniture into our home. Um, and uh, that's sort of thing that you would never normally consider doing, but mm. we wanted to move house and that's how we, we had to do it. Um, you know, just things that were so abnormal became normal really quickly. Mm. So you, are you hybrid now then, or you still work from home? Yeah. So I'm, I'm a hybrid. I'm, uh, I work two days a week, uh, on campus at the university of Leeds and then three days a week I, I work from, from home. Mm -hmm. And for me, I think actually that's a really positive thing. Mm -hmm. Um, I still have plenty of appointments to see face to face. Most, most students who want to see me can see me within a week face to face, mm -hmm. but I also have a lot of flexibility to see people online. There are lots of people who prefer that, you know, with my line of work, there are students who would come and see me and, you know, mm -hmm. burst into tears and I have to walk back through campus kind of all mm -hmm. nothy and, and teary. So there are people who much prefer to do these meetings from, from home. And I try and both the schedule very on the day. So I'm from home and that allows me to kind of, you know, do management -y bits and do kind of project work, mm -hmm. organize welcome week and respond to all of my emails. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm, I, I'm definitely glad I'm not a hundred percent from home. I just, I find that really difficult seeing people every week. It's such a positive thing for, for me, but I'm not sure I want to go back to working in an office five days a week. And I think like a lot of people in the conversation I've had is I'm very happy to go into the office to work and I'm, I enjoy the time around. I love seeing my colleagues, mm. but what I don't want to do is be told to come into the office additional days to sit by myself all day doing teams meetings with other people who aren't, yeah. aren't in the office. Yeah. And as we change our ways of working at the University of Leeds, we kind of introduce different places where students can go for initial queries. We're doing more things electronically and remotely and over video call. Actually, it doesn't, it doesn't feel like I would do much more if I'm on campus mm. the days where I'm at home kind of allow me to have a lot more control over my, my work. Mm. I, I quite like that, that balance. Mm. And it means, you know, especially in summer, I finish at five o'clock, four o'clock, I put some Jacob, Jacob potatoes in the supper in the oven, half past five, I'm out walking on the moor and I've got two or three hours of daylight to kind of enjoy the day. And it's mm. much better for my well-being as well. So yeah, I really like that, that hybrid world, but I, I don't think we've quite certainly in my experience, and this isn't to cast any lights on the University of Leeds, but I think in my experience, I think probably wider in society, we haven't quite got our heads around what hybrid working means and how do we get the most out of the workforce who are in an office at certain times and how do we ensure we're getting the most out of that time whilst they're in the office and mm. we're working from home the rest of the time and how do we kind of balance different teams that can come on and balance mm. spaces and, and balance the benefits for staff not being on all the time but with the additional cost of having to run a, a home office it's true it's, mm. i don't think we're quite there yet i like to think that kind of as the years go on this will be normal and people will kind of find ways to make this work get more people who are going up into senior leadership who just see this as a normal thing and understand mm. how to best out of it but it's it, it it such a massive change you know like it's from because there were people working from home obviously you know you had been an example of that in that previous role but it was sort of few and far between and like occasionally you get a few workplaces where it's like oh I'm, you know they're they're sort of or you can work from home one or two days a week or you know mm. some places that do it but then when everyone had to do it, well, not everyone, but you know, like a huge, a huge yeah. section had to do it. Yeah. I'd, and yeah, we're, uh, the, we're nowhere near that battle, but I think it was a big catalyst in sort of opening that, opening up that possibility for a lot of places mm -hmm. of like, oh, well, yeah, we do want to have workers in the building when we can see them and sort of like manage them. Um, mm -hmm. But also we could save some money on building costs and <laughs> like various other things and you know there are health benefits and other benefits for staff from it and there are productivity gains from it as well mm. so yeah like but, but it, it's weighing that balance and it's weighing that balance for particular industries and particular roles and stuff so i don't think it's going to take ages to kind of mash out but i think we've speeded up that process yeah and definitely you know one of the conversations that comes up at at the university, I perhaps kind of sometimes at odds with my own personal experience of enjoying working from home is, you know, students do a huge amount of stuff on campus. And one of the challenges of people working from home is you lose some of the vibrancy 
mm. of, of campus and you know, people mm. talk about losing the vibrancy of offices, but actually for students, seeing people around is a really important part of their learning experience. And mm. how do you find a reasonable gap between what can be perhaps competing priorities, recognizing that there isn't an easy answer to this. You know, historically everyone worked in an office because that's what you did. And now mm. suddenly we've been able to ask the question, there isn't an easy answer to what the right thing is. Are we different in different workplaces, mm. in different offices between different teams? Mm. You know, it's even between different people. If you've got childcare responsibilities working from home, we can actually be great. Maybe you don't need to, maybe you can't supervise kids all of the time, but actually it makes doing a score a lot easier. It makes, yeah. gives you a lot more kind of time. Now, even us, you know, on my lunch break, I can go and do the dishwasher and I can yeah. pop to the shops and get food for supper in the evening in the yeah. way that when I'm on campus, you know, I can't pop to the shops and buy three bags of groceries and then carry them home on the train, but I can when I'm working from home. But I think this comes back to honesty and transparency and kind of being very clear with students, the benefits mm. for staff and the benefits for them as they go into the, the workforce to graduate and just recognizing that there isn't an easy solution and being open, honest, and adults and having that conversation, I think so important. Mm. Mm. You know, I, I'm getting to the point with these where I feel like I don't always have time to explore all of the things mm. that I, I train it, you know, cause I, I don't, I'm not going to, I think we kind of, well, let's, let's have a bit on work-life balance and the sort of uh, like through that process, I mean, Again, because you'd had that previous experience and you say, you know, you, you were better at kind of calling the warning signs. Um, do you think, were you good at cutting off at that point or did you, were you working too much? Were you quite good when you went into lockdown of like, right, this is cut off or did, was it a whole new set of problems of sort of, well, did you have office space and that kind of stuff? How, how easy was that adaption? Uh, so my office space was my bedroom. I had a, a desk mm. at the first of my bed. I was one of those people who kind of, you know, before I have a lovely bookcase, but I mean, now with books and pictures, but I had to have a virtual background on because I just didn't feel it was appropriate to sit down with students, talk about their mental health with a place where I slept literally behind me and often some <laughs> snoring cats in the middle of the bed. I think I was in terms of kind of being able to regulate myself, I feel very passionately it, it, part of my job is encouraging students to look after their well-being. I think it's really. It would have been wrong of me, fundamentally wrong of me to spend all of my time since just look after well being and then working above and beyond. And I know colleagues who did that and colleagues who were in different working situations who, who had no choice because without that, maybe things would have fallen down. Mm. And I was very lucky to never be in a situation where I wasn't able to kind of manage things through a nine to five and were there things that didn't happen? Sure. But I was able to justify and say, actually, I have to look after my own well-being and I have to be in the right place. Because if I push myself too hard, I then burn out to take a year off mm. or six months off or even two or three days. Mm. That's worse than me not doing the, the nine to five. But, but I had kind of another part of my life going on as well, which was that I had flights booked for April 2020. So take me on an airplane to New York where I was planning a solo bike ride across America. So as the world was locking down. I was kind of at the peak of my training and planning and logistics for all this fundraising. And even kind of mid-March, I'd been asked, well, are you going to do this bike ride? And I was like, well, I'm, I'm waiting to hear from the travel agents, like maybe we'll open up in a couple of weeks. And that, that had been the project I'd rebuilt myself around after having a mental health breakdown. And so yeah. I just, I kind of had to really just fundamentally acknowledge that things were out of my hands and go, I can kind of worry and stress about all of this stuff where I can just say, I'm going to wake up, cook breakfast, eat breakfast, work go for a walk, enjoy my yeah. time with my wife, play games, do jigsaws, paint bathroom cupboards. And that is something that will be, I'm going to enjoy living in the moment because I can't change what's going on outside. Mm. The only thing I can change is, is myself. Mm. Um, and, uh, so that was kind of this really totally bizarre experience because I was expecting to be in kind of Nevada and instead I was in Shipley. And, uh, <laughs> You know, there's a whole other comparison between those two places, but a whole other differences as, as well. Mm. Mm. So have you done the bike ride? Yeah. So, uh, I kind of like a lot of people, I spent a lot of COVID kind of arming and arming. We start coming back and then there's another lockdown and 
Uh, so I took flights in March, 2022. So nearly a two year. Years after. <laughs> yeah, yeah, two, two years, years after. Yeah. But I kind of had to kind of live a strange life where it was, you know, I, I knew I was going to find a way to, to do it. Mm -hmm. And I knew that there was more I wanted to do than just doing my kind of nine to five job. Mm. But I had, I was just totally dependent on the global situation. There's nothing I can do to change what's, what's going on. I was going to say, when did you know, like, what was the kind of like signal of like, okay, now, now I can do it now. Like I can book, we could go. In all honesty. The time that I felt I was going to finish the bike ride was about a month into the bike ride. Even as I was mm. flying out, there's a part of me going, what happens if we have a spring lockdown? What happens if America has mm. increased restrictions and I have to get a flight from Chicago and go home? It was only really as I came out of Chicago heading towards rural America where I was thinking, I'm not seeing another city until I reach San Francisco. No, I have a really big city. I, I can make this work. I can make this happen. Because for me, part of a ride, you know, we wasn't just about cycling. 4,000 miles across America or cycling up the heights of Mount Everest four times, <laughs> raising money for charity. It was knowing that this was a response to me struggling with isolation. And therefore the worst thing I could possibly do would be to take a tent and not speak to people. So I planned the ride in such a way that I would try and stay with as many people as possible. So there were people who went off and did rides like this in 2021, where it's just them with their tent and they go into Walmart and buy fruit and never see anyone. Whereas I was seeing people every evening, I was spending time with people who were immunocompromised, who had young kids. So I needed the world to, to, to feel safe. Mm. Uh, and the ride for me, I guess, you know, coming back to this, this idea of work-life balance. I love my job. I'm very passionate about my job. I don't always agree with my employer, but I'm very passionate about my job. But there is so much more to life than what I do between nine and five. And having this opportunity to do this incredible adventure and to see America on the ground and stay with people in cities and rural town of people pass me their guns and watch America react to Roe v. Wade and climb up, you know, to cycle up hill for so six or seven days to reach the top of the Rocky mountains and get mm -hmm. an idea for just how vast the landscape is, has kind of helped me uh, realize something I think I've always known, but actually work is just a fraction of what we do. And if you are if you allow yourself to focus on what happens between nine and five and don't throw yourself in proper adventures, you're missing out on a huge, you know, it's like playing a video game, but never doing any of the kind of hidden levels. It's you're just going through it by roads and following the guidebook. And actually it's this incredible world out there. And I was very lucky to kind of be in a place where I could afford to do this and have people that kind of supported me and mm -hmm. still bang off to death. And I don't quite know how I'll do that, but the experience to me was worth every single penny and the friends I made, like, just incredible. So how much work did you put into that not work thing? Uh, cause you, was, you were working every day. You were cycling hundreds of miles every day. So, so I was planning the ride for pretty much five years by the time I went, yeah. uh, you know, weeks of work went into, you know, looking at the route maps for every single day, going on Google maps and thinking, I need to get from this point in Chicago to this point in Chicago. How do I do that without being hit by a car? Mm. You know, reaching out to people I was going to stay with, sitting on the bicycle, which I did not do enough of before I went and, and mm. training. Cause you know, that's the important on, you know, fundraising, sitting in kind of, you know, sitting out under a marquee in the rain, sitting on my bike, hoping that people are going to give a bit of money to, to charity kind of emotionally preparing myself to be away from my friends and family, family for, for three months. And then I was out in America for three months cycling most days, six, seven hours, having these incredible adventures, but putting this, you know, it was a huge chunk of my, my life. Um, and it was, I mean, I, it's impossible to quantify and, and I raised 30,000 pounds for charity. Yeah, I was going to ask. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's great. And you know, it's probably, there probably is this irony that if I took all of that time I did and I went and worked at a local restaurant at kind of minimum wage, I probably have made the same amount of money, but I was able to. No, you wouldn't. You <laughs> wouldn't have made that much. <laughs> uh, well, maybe over five years or all the evenings. Yeah, yeah. By pride. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But maybe over that really long time, but I was really lucky to have this experience where, you know, uh, a lot of my job is about connecting with people. It's about finding a way to connect with students, to make it easy for them to come and speak with me, to create a space when they speak to me, 
uh, where it's safe for them to tell me what's going on and to kind of signpost them to support and encourage them to sign up. And this ride really was kind of a reflection about it. I had this incredible opportunity to connect with people all the way across America and to hear their stories like this, you know, social media page. So I'm talking about what I'm actually doing every day and I'm 12, 1300 people kind of following me in the end. And there was people who I've never met before, friends of friends of friends who were kind of checking in on me every day and kind of commenting on every photo and, you know, mm. cheering me on when it was going great and, you know, having my back when I was struggling. And again, I was trying very hard to be open on that. And, but I don't want to sit here and say there are lives that changed, but the, the journey. It Your started. life's changed. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. There was a mutual exchange of you know, my <laughs> life's changed. And there were times when my journey brought me and other people together and helped us mm. learn things about ourselves. And that's incredibly important for, mm. for, for me. Yeah. Um, so have you got a record of it? Do you, do you put the, everything on social media? Yeah. The whole range on social media. I took like 5,000 photos. Uh, I started writing kind of a bit of a book and it's like, I really want to do is kind of find a way to kind of get all of these incredible stories down and, and, sh and share them. Mm. But you know, life doesn't always treat you with a fairness you think it, it should do. You know, I've, I've talked about how, you know, in, in, in COVID and when we, we talk about work, you know, it's important to think that lots of other things that are impacting us. So during COVID, I'm worried about my mom and being in a nursing home. And in 2021, my dad gets diagnosed with cancer and he goes through. You know, I haven't seen him for a year. I can't go see him. We're in full lockdown. And just as we're about to be able to go and, go and see him, literally mm. about two or three days before I'm driving, get going to get there, a car and drive down. He gets a call saying, you're coming in to keep a therapy. You can't see anyone else. You're going to be super immunocompromised. I don't see him for another three or four months. And he comes out of that and he gets told, it's gone because of a type of cancer it is. It probably will come back, but we'd expect three, five, eight years. And that's in kind of December, November, 2021. And I go off, I do the bike ride and I come back and I go and see him a couple of days after I, after I arrive back in the UK, I, I fly back on the Monday, get home Monday evening, sleep most of Tuesday. I drive down to go see him on a Friday and we go for a walk and he said, my cancer's back and it's terminal. Nothing we can do about it now. And I don't know if I'm going to be here at Christmas. And I go from the most incredible positive experience of my life. You know, if we think of life as a roller coaster. I don't think if I will yeah. ever do anything as great as riding across America, obviously apart from getting married and having yeah. kids, I'm sure I'm contractually obliged to say that, but for me as an individual who has struggled with depression and self-worth to cycle across America and to prove, on your own to do for yourself. Yeah, that, absolutely. And, uh, and not even, you know, for myself, but you know, I'm not, I'm not a brilliant cyclist. For me, this is a representation of anyone who can go off and chase their dreams and to be able mm. to be in that place where I inspired people. I come back over this incredible place and then just go to one of the worst days of my life when I find mm. out that actually I'm not going to get a chance to enjoy this and to celebrate it because now something I have to be in this world where I'm having to confront the mortality of, you know, of, of my own dad. And he, luckily he's still with us now. You know, they said Christmas would be a miracle and we're kind of here in February and he's still here, but. We all know if we were on borrowed time and I'm kind of living this, this strange world where suddenly I'm just in survival mm. mode mm. and you just never know what life is going to throw at you. And you just never know what's going to, to happen. And you think you're having a great time and terrible things happen and you're having a terrible time and wonderful things happen. Yeah. <laughs> and yes, yeah. but in yeah, life isn't something we can write the script for. We can go off and do all the things you want to, but sometimes you just have to realize that it's difficult and mm. you have to get through that in the best way you can and mm. know that it will get better again in the future. Mm. I, I'm really lucky now to be, or well, whenever I'm facing a problem, I can say to myself, well, if I, if I can cycle over the Rocky Mountains, I can deal with this. If I can mm. cycle to 10,000 feet, I can deal with whatever it is that's going on. Yeah. 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 That's it. Um, Okay, so, all right, let's go from there to climate change. Perfect. Let's, we'll, we'll, we'll not go into Brexit yet. Or <laughs> So, you work at the university, it's yep. Leeds, there's a climate emergency, the uni's pretty good on their green agenda, especially, well, in what they're saying, um, and, and, and a lot of what they're doing. Um, like, how much does it come up? For you, is it something that's a concern? Is it something that you can act on? Like, 
what what can you do in your role in terms of mitigation, adaptation, or awareness raising in, with regard to climate change? I mean, the short answer is I can probably do more. Um, yeah, I, like, I'm really passionate about the environment, but in my job, I feel like I've kind of taken one of the great challenges that we face as humanity at this point in time, which is uh, kind of mental health and a recognition that the way that we have for the last couple of centuries dealt with the normal challenges that we face is not a healthy coping mechanism and we need to find an alternative way of making it normal to not be okay. That feels like a huge problem, but certainly Western society as in the society that I have knowledge of is dealing with right now. Yeah. And that feels like the problem because when I'm at work, I, there's not, you know, I try and be as sustainable as possible as work and kind of recycle, et cetera. But, you know, my job doesn't necessarily involve changing the world from a climate perspective, apart from occasionally trying to, you know, persuade my colleagues that wouldn't life be better if we had a, you know, the 30 to 40% reduction in vehicle miles that almost every climate scientist says we need to have to, uh, you know, cope with, well, not even cope with climate change, but to stop climate change at the point we are now and kind of convert them on my kind of pro walking side thing. 15 minute cities thinking that until recently yeah. it was kind of this wonderful utopian thing and suddenly is now the nightmare of the hardcore conservative right, well, I, I, which I do not understand how that has happened. But day to day, there's not a huge amount I can do to kind of shape sustainability. Um, you know, if I was, if I was a politician looking for an answer to try and make myself look better, I could maybe say, well, I'm supporting and empowering the next generation of leaders to find an authentic voice which may help them with climate change, but I, I don't really have much to do with, with sustainability. And when I take my work out off, there's a whole lot of things I do, but it's not something sadly I get much of a chance to do in my, in my professional career. I, I, I'm going to offer my services to people as a, a greenwashing uh, consultant <laughs> because like, I could totally spin something up from that. Of like, you know, again, you, 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 you've halved your commute at least in the last couple of years. I mean, the whole cycling, I mean, that's a large cycling promotion thing right. there. You're in the art schools. Um, and, you know, it's the, the artists that are going to create the visions and, and so on for our way forward. So, you know, there, there's a lot more there that you could kind of big yourself up for than, but I know what you mean. It's kind of like, I'd like to be doing something active within mm. the role. Like, um, it's that sense that, Cause it's all well and good for an organization to talk about it, but it's like, how, wh when does that appear in my work? When, when can I, mm. does that make sense? Yeah. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm just rewatching the TV series 2012, which is a very British thing where we kind of commissioned a comedy series about the 2012 Olympics to show how Britishly bad we would be at organizing London 2012. Mm. And they have this kind of running joke of, you know, sustainability is this kind of director who doesn't do it just as sustainability and it's not embedded in. And, you know, there's lots of stuff I do over, you know, when we, by our, our, you know, by catering for, for meetings, the vast majority of what we buy is vegetarian and vegan because we know that a vegetarian and vegan diet has a lot lower carbon footprint and environmental footprint than, than a vegetarian and vegan diet. And, you know, in my personal life, I, I don't have a car. I commute to work by train. When we, when we moved house, we looked at where our places have been a 10 minute walk of a train station. Mm. And, and so kind of, you know, I'm not bringing that to, to, to work and, um, you know, but day to day, I'm not one of those people who's able to come over and say, my job, you know, I'm not a private scientist or someone who's changing, trying to uh, change the, the world within their, their, their job. And I, yeah, I, I, I do my little bit. Yeah. 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 Well, that's all you can do though. Yeah. You know, I, I say it's back to control, isn't it? It's like, like mm. well. What, what can I control? What, what can I do? What can I control? Um, yeah. Which uh, again is why, you know, I sort of say, cause I've worked in places that have had good sort of green agendas saying mm. good stuff, but it's kind of like you do the job and you know, I, I, I'm doing the job and I'm conscious of, I'm using electricity all day. I'm using all of the like cups, refreshment, eating packaged food because I can't be bothered sorting lunches out before all that mm. kind of stuff you know like you the stuff that you're doing that you're like i wish i wasn't doing this and i wish i could 
contribute to ways to change in this, not just changing my own behavior, but changing behavior around. But mm. I think it's more and more I'm thinking it has to be, you know, it's, it's lead by example kind mm. of thing. Um, I think what are the thought that goes through my, my head regularly? There's so much incredible stuff that the University of Leeds does around climate change. Now, um, mm. we have people who are going to COP26 who are kind of leading expeditions. Our, you know, our, our chancellor is a, someone who's done regular expeditions to uh, the, you know, the North Pole, South Pole, mm. and kind of, you know, being a part of world-changing science. Mm. We have Institute for Fabric Textile Science kind of looking at how do we massively reduce the footprint, the carbon footprint of the, the fashion world. We have an Institute for Transport Studies that's kind of one of the leading bodies and employs some really incredible scientists who are looking at things like how do we change society? How do we change how we travel as a society to be more sustainable? Mm. Yeah, we, we have the Institute for High Speed Rail looking at kind of research and policy around high speed rail. And there's all sorts of really great things that we're doing. And I guess the question that I often ask myself and I have asked kind of in the university and don't have much control over is, but to what extent do, do we as an organization and not just the University of Leeds, but does any organization ensure that we are not accidentally undermining ourselves by other decisions that we make? For example, there is a large public campaign going on at the University of Leeds to divest from inviting fossil fuel companies to come onto campus mm -hmm. to yeah. stop receiving research from fossil fuel companies. Yeah. The University of Leeds main bank is Barclays, who have a proven track record of investing in fossil fuels. Yeah. And whilst they do lots of, I'm sure, but they have reports, we'll talk about all the green stuff they do, very, they have all sorts of terrible things that that bank is, is doing. And mm. How do we ensure that as an organization, we are living the values that we our world changing science, mm. our world changing research, research knows to be true. Mm. And, you know, unfortunately I've got nodes I can do to kind of, you know, make that happen. I'm in my role as an assistant manager of a student education service in two schools. I can't fundamentally change our bank account over, overnight, but kind of, I'm really interested to see conversations like that unfold. Mm. And, and I guess kind of watch a, this new younger generation who are coming through university each year and universities has wonderful places where the student population changes every three years and everything is different. Mm. You know, how, how did they help the university identify where there are problems, ensure that those are dealt with. And then secondly, I think what I see is what I think we're seeing in society wider right now, but there's a really big gap between the science, what we know we need to be doing mm. and what we are doing because mm. change is uncomfortable. Mm. I'm sure there's lots of great stuff universities well, at least and also the, religion. Yeah, and also the public don't know. It's like we're all we all know it's there and aware of it, but it's like you you don't know. Like I'm I'm sure both you and I have got heads full of various facts and and this that and the other about climate change. But at the at the big scale, you you don't. No, you know, like, because there are so many variables to it and there's so much that scientists are arguing about and, and there's so many layers to it and so many, like, you know, like, because it's so fucking huge, it's like, it's not just, well, it'll get warmer and then, you know, it's like, well, well you're not going to have any food no, because, well, how do we not have any food? Well, some of it's burnt and some of it like can't grow in this region because the temperature, like all of these things and like currents and airflow and <laughs> like mm. sections warming faster than other sections and cold snaps and huge vast movements of temperatures suddenly jetting around and like all of this stuff and we're not we're not built to think like that uh, and i think we've got so used to life the, the, the way we are and you know fundamentally one of my big passions i'm really passionate about climate change i'm really passionate about how we move as humans and how the invention of the automobile and the normality of motoring has fundamentally changed how we work as a society. And I see it in our local society. I saw it in America. You see, you know, broken town after broken town and then one town that has the Walmart mm. and the school and the shop mm. communities going, isn't this terrible as they drive to the Walmart and they go, well, you realize it's the car that has caused your problem. And what I saw repeatedly in America is 
when they talk about climate change, they don't talk about how do we stop the activities we are doing, which we know to be harmful. They talk about how do we mitigate about what's going on? You know, it's not about in the areas. How do we make the world stop doing a climate change so we can keep doing what we're doing? (laughs) You know, we, we are over farming and there isn't enough water for everyone and we're still but it's not about, we're not going to build more houses and encourage people to walk to work in places where there is enough water. We're going to reduce our agriculture. It's well, how do we get every drop of agriculture? How do we, you know, bring in water from other places? It's, it's not, how do we stop climate change happening by reducing our motoring? It's how do we build bigger levees to, you know, and in some sequence cities, I'm literally talking about building these 10 meter walls all the way along the city because otherwise oh, the city will flood and you go, well, if with all the money you're spending on that, spend that on activities which change the contribution to to the climate change. You know, one of the big bugbears I have about working at the University of Leeds, and if any of my colleagues are listening to this and have got this far, this will be the point where they start texting me and going, Anthony, what the heck are you talking about? Now, I've said before, most climate scientists recognize that the only sort of sector of emissions within the UK that has not seen a drop of CO2 emissions over the last 10, 15 years is the transport sector. Mm. That is specifically because of the continued growth of car sales and use of cars. And even with electric vehicles, mm. the inherent uh, sort of carbon emissions of those, both in terms of building them, in terms of a heavier vehicles to power, and in terms of where that power comes from. And almost everyone, certainly within the world that I'm in, and maybe there are people out there with different opinions, but what I'm reading as climate scientists are regularly saying, just to maintain where we are right now, not even to reverse climate change, we need to build by the end of 2030, a 30, 40% reduction in the amount of vehicle miles. And you look at all of the councils around Leeds and they're all saying, this is what we're going to do. We're going to reduce our vehicle miles by 30, 40%. North Yorkshire have got it. West Yorkshire's got it. Bradford's got it. Leeds got it. You go, great. What are you doing about that? They go, we're building more roads. And you go, no, that, that doesn't, that's going to get more cars on the road. And they go, yes, mm-hmm. but we're going to reduce the number of vehicle miles. And you go, but, but how? I think we're going to have to start facing the fact that some of the things that will happen will be uncomfortable if we want to avoid catastrophic changes to how society exists on our planet. We are going to have to do, stop doing some of the things that we want to do. And that means you cannot drive a mile and a half to your local supermarket in a Range Rover because it's convenient to do it once a week. We will need to change our planning policies to have more shops in the places where we live. And you'll have to walk a couple of times a week. That means we'll have to reallocate road space to walking and cycling and scootering. That means that we'll have to stop flying people all over the world, which the university is already trying to do, to attend academic conferences and do more things via via video conferences. That means that we need to acknowledge the historic damage that we have done as an industrialized society and support um, kind of other countries around the world who are dealing daily with the impact of our kind of climate emissions. Mm. Mm. Well, I mean, you can see that on a microcosm as well in terms of, um, you know, like the way that money is invested in this country and like, you know, how the disinvestment and underdevelopment of the North, that's going to leave us more susceptible overall. And, you know, there will be more damage and more destruction here. And is anyone going to come and do anything about it? No, why should they? You know, it's, it's up there. It's in the hinterland where it doesn't matter, you know. And when you look at, you know, the levelling up funds, and I know we've kind of got a bit, a bit away from work, but look at the levelling up funds that are being announced at the moment. And just look at how many of those are road improvement schemes, roads being dual carriage way, new roundabouts being built to improve traffic flow to save maybe 20, 30 seconds of a journey. And, you know, these roundabouts cost 30, 40 million pounds. Like, I'm the chair of a group that's campaigning for a safe walking and cycling route along the Wharf Eye. whole thing will probably cost 30 to 40 million pounds. Mm. 15 mile bypass. That's one roundabout, and it's stuff that's been built in Leeds at the moment. Now, Leeds is doing some great stuff around sustainable travel. And just last week, I had a conversation with a student who lives in Headingley, turned up for a meeting for bike home. I said, Did you know there's a consultation going on about the main road through Headingley into Leeds? And she went, Oh, no, even with the pop up bike lane, it's terrifying the cycle. Off. And there's an mm. incredible consultation, very well researched about. Slowing down that road, introducing more spaces for humans, stopping some of a really dangerous, blocking up some of a really dangerous side mm. roads where there are accidents, putting in permanent segregated bike lanes, and ultimately bring that almost all the way to the university. We're seeing more students cycling onto campus, more students, obviously, a high number of students walking onto campus. Mm. 
And then I look at things going on on campus. They just resurfaced a bit of road near where I work. I've done redone all of the line parks. And it, this will sound, this will sound really silly. It's a road and they've repainted it. It's a road and you go, but actually the vast majority of people across that space are not road users. Mm. There are people who are walking from one place to another. Why are we mm. not narrowing the roads, slowing the speeds, making the default, mm. the pedestrian, having more separate crosses? Like there's so much campus could do to become more walking and friendly, walking and cycling friendly. Yeah, but Jeremy Clarkson will have a tantrum. So, you know, we've got to make him happy. <laughs> but, and this is the thing that makes me kind of just, you know, sit in the hall and just go, you know, you have all this huge weight of climate opinion. And I think the university does do a really good job of communicating kind of climate science. So I think a lot of universities, that's, that's what they're, they're good at. Mm. And then you have people who say, but I want to do this. This is going to have an impact on me. And, and that I think is a fundamental question that we face as a society. How do we? This will have an impact on me and I'm rich. So therefore, no, you can't yeah. do it. <laughs> you can't drive this road. I, I drive along it every day. Well, I'm sorry, but we cannot do as much driving as we're going to do. Yeah. It's, I don't know what the answer is. But... So I'll do the social media question. Yeah. So I don't know how much, I mean, obviously you did some social media for the students and stuff for your role. Like how much yeah. does it take up? Um, do you find it useful, valuable, or is it kind of well, a uh, hassle? <laughs> I've stopped doing the social media stuff now because for a couple of years we had a Facebook page mm. of a, you know, as a school where we kind of put things up and people can interact. And now when your students go on, say, we don't use Facebook anymore. It's, it's changed. It's TikTok, Snapchat, Instagram. And the amount of time I have to do things like this has kind of changed a little bit. I've got to have a thing so I have to prioritize now. So how has social media changed my working life? Well, apart from it, I probably spent too much of my commute on social media myself, but I don't think it's had a huge impact on me, apart from the fact that we have a generation of young people who are social media literate. Um, I guess there's kind of two specific thoughts I would offer in response to this, to this question. I think the first is that the way that we communicate to society is, is changing. It's been changing for a while, mm. but we've now got a generation of people who are coming up for universities who are literate in this style, who will communicate. And who I think do a really good job of sharing what's going on and kind of having some honesty and, and transparency. And I'm interested to see what that would mean for the kind of working world for them as they graduate and go out and become professionals. And, and the second thing is, is, is I guess around the mental health impact of social media and a, a story I like to chat about with students that I call baked beans on toast, which is the idea that there's well evidenced, I just say well evidenced research. That's a terrible way to start a sentence. There is research to show <laughs> that when we go on social media, we curate our life and depending on what the platform is, we show the best. So I'll, I'll get a room full of students and I'll say, right, who here? has had baked beans on toast over the last six months. So if it's not baked beans on toast, another toast based marmite on toast, marmite on toast. Every single person sits their hand up. I'm a student. Of course I've had baked beans on toast. Of course I've had marmite on toast. Okay, right. Keep your hand up if you put a picture on social media. Every single hand in the room goes down. <laughs> I say, right. Stick your hand up if you've had a really lovely meal in the last six months. Maybe you've cooked something really special for your friends, your family. Maybe you've been to a really fancy restaurant, had nice drinks. The pause there was like, yeah, no, no, I've been to a restaurant. Okay, keep your hand up if you put a picture of it online. Everyone looks around and realizes I've kept that hands up. Uh, we see a lot of young people these days who describe to me that they feel like they don't fit in. Everyone else is having a better time of life. Mm. And I think it's because they live their life in a way where what they're saying is curated and they are mm. seeing the best of lives. And the reality is that, you know, I've been that bugger who goes for a really nice meal and takes a photo and puts it online. Um, but what I would normally do is then say, well, I want on this really nice meal because I'm struggling with my mental health because of what's going on with my family mm. right now. Mm. And so I try quite hard to kind of get them to think about how do you challenge the voices, your own internal monologue of you're not doing as much as, as anyone else. Now it's this kind of jokey phrase of FOMO versus fear of missing out. Mm. But I think it hides a really difficult truth where if you live a life where all you see is people being successful and social media influencers are just 
incredible, well-toned bodies because I can spend all my time in the gym and eating healthy. Mm. And you're, you know, this kind of slightly balding Devonian who now lives in Yorkshire with a bit more of a gut than when you cycled across America. You sit there and think, well, I'm not as handsome as people. I'm not having as much fun. Look at all the fun they're having in that market. But we can't mm. all be social media influencers. And even when we see our friends, we're only seeing the best. And we see, you know, students will come to me and say, everyone else is doing really well with their dissertation and I'm not. And I'll go, you are not the first person in my office crying about your dissertation today, but the people mm. who talk about it publicly are the people who are doing well. Mm. And it, it comes back to, I think, that line we talked about earlier about how do we make talking about how you're feeling not, how do we ensure that social media is not something that is a detractor, but something that is a space to, to be honest. And something I tried really hard to do at my bike ride across America was mm. not just share, look at all these incredible, look at this free plate breakfast I've had, look at this view of a Rocky mountains, look at this wonderful kitten that's fallen asleep on me whilst I'm, you know, acclimatizing to the heights in Fort Collins, but here's me crying at the top of a mountain because I didn't know I was going to get up here. And here's me looking really pissed off at the side of a road with sunburn, if I'm really pissed off at the side of a room with sunburn and the wind's blowing over my face, <laughs> what well, the hell did I decide to do this? And here's me, you know, missing my family back home because it's really difficult. And here's me yeah. telling you that I'm doing this because I've had a mental health breakdown. So I think social media can be a huge force for good, but I think it can also be a huge force for negativity. Again, it, uh, it needs regulation. Mm. Um, you know, because it's you're not going to have voluntary guidelines. So, I, 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 it was making me think a lot of things as you were as you were saying that, um, and you know when you were talking about cars earlier, I've got a big like just Marshall McLuhan's ringing in my head, and I think it's sort of remembering when I did my Australia trip, sort of like remember driving along the Gold, is it the Gold Coast Road in South Australia, whatever it's called, um. No, it's not the Gold Coast Road, but there, there's a big road in South Australia. You go past the Seven Sisters, and, um, and there's boat loads of tour, like you know, coach loads of tourists, and they all pull up, all disembark, and everyone's just in the phone, you know, right? Not not being there, mm. you know, the whole thing's experienced through the camera, and your photo is full of other people. So you, you're just there with a the camera taking a photo of other people that you're with taking photos of a thing and then you get back on and it's like how is that how is that anything you know and then everyone wants that shot and what and what are the shots that we're going for what are the shots that we're composing we're composing these shots from from advertising from tv from you know like trying to live the dream kind of thing of like mm -hmm. you know sunsets and filters and white sandy beaches and all of that kind of stuff but that's all stuff that you've grown up with you know, in the advertising to say, like, this is, these are the exotic things and stuff. Mm. Like, I think the way that those, the, the image creation, you know, like, I think we need to focus a lot more on, on the imagery. I don't know. I don't It's an incomplete thought. But uh, well, I guess one of my worries is it's very easy to see this as something. And I've reached a stage now. I, I have, I have TikTok. Mm. I, I get to see Francis Bourgeois go and trade spotting and it's great. And I have Instagram and in reality, I post most of the time and occasionally I look and I go, oh, look, someone's a kid. This is great. And so I, I kind of reached out, I, I've given up with keeping up with, with social media. I had to for my bike ride, but now there's more to life than I want to do. I'd rather do a jigsaw than be on social media. Mm. And so it's very easy to look at kind of these young people with very Instagram lifestyles and kind of go, what they're doing isn't how we did it. Mm. But I speak to other young people who go, I go on social media to hear about recommendations for well-being podcasts. I, you know, go on social media to, to share our own feeling and to connect with family around the country or I wouldn't get a chance to speak to you. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I speak to people who part of the LGBT community, who are trans, who have ties, who come from a particular cultural background country, make sure a particular religious background, and they use social media as a way of connecting with other people, as mm. a way of creating a safe space for them to meet people, mm. be who they are mm. in a world where maybe, and sadly we're seeing this around the world now, it is who they are as something that is being 
attacked publicly. Mm. And I think there is huge power in that. I'm probably one of the last people who remembers the arrival of social media. I grew up in schools. When I went to school, I remember getting a computer in the school. I remember mm. the day I got my Bebo account back in the good old days. I remember the day I had a MySpace and I remember the day I set up Facebook. And social media now is a part of, of where we are. And I don't think it's going away. And we're seeing it's a massive source of disinformation, lies, mm. of misinformation. But I think it also does have a huge positive power. And fundamentally, what's the difference between Facebook and a pub? You know, historically, you can go into a pub and go and spout whatever they want with their friends. And that's, that's fine. Facebook is just a space where people can have a conversation. And no, maybe that's... Sorry, I was going to say they haven't started any coups. <laughs> well, well uh, you, uh, do you name me a coup that's happened in the 20th century? I can tell you the pub where people have seen before. You look at, <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't want in any way to kind of fall foul of Godwin's law, but look at, you know, the Munich Beer Hall Butch. You know, mm. people have always found a space to sit down and share their views. Social mm. media allows some of those views to be amplified on a much bigger scale. But it also creates a safe space for people who to kind of share views and, you know, it's a platform that I have used to share my own mental health story and to try and change the world to make talking about mental health a better place. And I think one of the things that's really important to me is that we're not just thinking about how do we change the social media. Obviously there's stuff we use around keeping people safe, regulation and around content moderation, but how do we ensure that we are giving our young people skills, the experience, the knowledge, the morals to use it as a force for good and not to force them. Mm. Mm. You can have the perfect tool or one, you know, the best pub in the world, but people can still go and say terrible things. And it, it's, so that is kind of something that I find really interesting. Mm. 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 Okay. Uh, let's do what have we got left. Brexit. Yay. Um, <laughs> so, since we have brexited, uh, have you noticed any change in your work? Uh, and if so, has it been good or bad? I have definitely noticed some changes. I, I, it's, it's difficult for me to sit here and say this is something that has specifically changed. I mm -hmm. think there are definitely, and you know, let's be upfront and say I'm, I'm not a fan of Brexit. I think it was a bad political decision. I think it was a a mechanism by a group of people with a particular set of political beliefs to harness the widespread angst upset that exists in this country about life feeling less good than it was a few years ago and turn that to their own agenda. Mm. And I could probably sit here and I could start off with a couple of small examples and I will give a couple of small examples about my workplace and then I can talk about some of the wider implications we've, we've seen. One of the thoughts that will come back to me is where is the, the flip side of the, you know, the here are the things that have changed. Everything I can give is worse. I cannot think of a single example within my workplace where things are better because of Brexit. Mm. And I'm not aware of any examples beyond the generic, vague sense of national identity and taking control. Mm. There are very few improvements, especially if you have the political beliefs that I do of kind of progressive social values mm -hmm. within higher education. We've seen the end of freedom of movement. You know, we, there were kind of university, you know, European wide cultural exchanges, things like Erasmus that are being you know, replaced and changed, but won't be as good as they were before. Mm -hmm. Research funding from the European Union, we can no longer apply for and the UK government has not mm. created the same amount of financial support mm. for UK universities to do research. Not my area of speciality, but mm. there is less money to do research than there was previously. Have you seen a drop off in students from EU students? My, my gut says anecdotally, yeah. Yes, but I, I yeah, but I, it's I too hard to tell. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't, I don't feel like I can sit down with the statistics and, and say there is a reduction. Yeah, what I can say that there has been is an a noticeable increase of international students who have suffered abuse while studying at the University of Leeds. 
And I think at universities across the UK, and I think mm. it is something that we have seen is that the, with the corresponding, the arrival of Brexit and the mm. empowerment of people who have a particular view of what the country looks like mm. is an emboldenment of those who wish to attack people because they are different. There is, you know, there are students, I have supported students who have been assaulted, mm. abused. And, and that is something that I have, have noticed in mm. the guidance for people in my workplace. I'm not one of them, but the guidance for people traveling abroad is like how complicated it needs to be in terms of insurance, et cetera. Mm. We're not in a single market, not in a single commonwealth area. Mm. But those are kind of the, the concrete things. I mm. mean, the, the bit that is difficult for, for me and I spoke of. No, I don't sit down with students and say, what do you think of Brexit? But I look at these young people who are going through university who have less opportunities than I, mm. who exist in a world where Europe is now a different, has a different relationship to who we are. We can talk about being, having a close European community, but the reality is we have left the European Union and that creates less opportunities. For well, the reality is we broke up with our largest trading par partner. Yeah. And threw away, you know, like loads of the easy trade. And I guess the biggest thing that kind of goes through our head, and it was really, yeah, Brexit was one of those things. Okay, I'm biased on that. Maybe there'll be people listening to this who have different views to me. That's all right. But I haven't found them yet. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly the circles I were in, you know, where there's a sense of, well, there's going to be a story, but of course it's not going to happen. And it happened. And you kind of think this is such a, a huge, challenge to who we are as a country and, you know, look at, um, what's happening to us as a country in terms of our economic situation compared with other countries who, who haven't gone through leaving the European Union and you just see financially as a country, the huge impact that has had on us. But I, when we think about universities and we think perhaps on a slightly more less practical day to day and more kind of the grand idea of a university as a learning place, as a place where we exchange knowledge, as a place where we dream of how the world can be a better place. And my degree was, was history. I did a lot of study of the second world war and of kind of the, the post-war environment. And there's this sense that, you know, in the 1930s and forties, Europe went to war as it has gone to war for millennia. Mm over territory or over disagreements. And we came out of that and people said, never again. We went through the first world war. We witnessed the rise of fascism, of, you know, political ideologies founded on a, uh, a belief and a victimization of it's someone else's fault. And we, we literally died and watched a generation of people down their lives to try and wrong, right the wrongs that we had seen. And we said, we do not need to do this again. We have reached an age where we should sit down and have conversations and we will not always agree, but it is better for us to sit around the table and try and make the world a better place. And now Britain, who were instrumental in setting that up, even Winston Churchill being instrumental in setting up has left that. And my worry is as we watch fascism on the increase mm. in within Europe and around the world, mm. as we, you know, we've talked about social media and kind of the easiness with which misinformation, disinformation and hatred can be spread. Yeah. But that's not just social media's fault. No, it's, it's not just social media's fault, but it allows it to be amplified. You know, yeah. one person can have But the traditional, the legacy media would like to blame it as if it's, this is the child of the, like the new media. It's like. You're the worst for it. Uh, <laughs> the ones that are taking it and going, look at all this terrible stuff. Isn't it yeah. terrible? And then agreeing with it and then yeah. getting columnists. Aren't they right though, really? Uh, yeah. Okay. And in, in this environment, we have stepped away from the table and said, we no longer want to be a part of this group of nations who exist in, a, in, a, in, in the same geographical space seeking to find reasonable compromises to our differences and make the world a better place. And I worry what that means for young people today. And especially when I, you know, when you look at the big problems at the University of Leeds, and I'm sure we have some minutes to talk about some of the challenges I face at the University of Leeds, but it does some incredible research things looking at what are the big challenges facing the world. 
with climate science, with inequality, with um, you know, kind of mental health, physiology, yeah, and kind of medicine. And kind of so many really big global challenges. And we're now in a uh, now in a world where these global challenges we need a global solution. When we've taken a step back from that, we've we've left that table for in the European Union, and it just obviously there's huge financial issues, there's huge trade issues, there's huge practical issues. There's, you know, all the little silly things we've had to do as a country to kind of keep going on our own. But fundamentally, our world outlook is smaller. And when I, when I have spoken to European students about Brexit, they, they always sort of laugh at us and go, what a ridiculous country you are. What a mm. silly decision you made. And mm. the rest of Europe kind of goes, well, of course we want to be part of this really cool club where we get to kind of trade with each other and, you know, we're, we're prosperous. And I don't know, I don't know where that goes, but I worry how not being at that table, how trying to create this historical Britain as a great, great country narrative in a world where Britain is no longer a great country and our living standards are falling below those of countries that we naturally assume we are better than. Well, we're being marked to market. We're being value. You know, it's like yeah. we've, we've gone for a valuation. Here's yeah. the real valuation. You know, reality doesn't, it doesn't, it's not bothered about your flag and your sense of whatever. Yeah. <laughs> doesn't, matter what, doesn't, yeah, doesn't matter what color you're, your passport is, <laughs> uh, and it's it just it was such a big decision, which has clearly turned out to be wrong. But it still is the basis for our country and decisions that we are making. And even the fact that you know when our current prime minister sometimes says, "Here are the five big priorities I want to work tackling inflation." NHS and all things where you kind of go, well, this is your own fault. You've made this problem. You can't be the savior of your own problem. You can't score an own goal and say, I'm going to score another goal and the other goal and make things better. You've scored the own goal. And then they say, one of the biggest problems is illegal boat crossings. And you go, yeah, like there are people who come into this country, but the reason they're doing that is because we've closed all of the legal routes for people to I come would to also this say Russian oligarchs are a bigger problem. Yeah. <laughs> but obviously they, they can't say that because, you know, difficult for a man to understand something when, his pay depends on him not understanding it. <laughs> and it's see the way that we phrase what is a humanitarian problem. There are countries around the world where people are discriminated against, uh, even though it's a disadvantage. It's, it's the same thing as like recycling straws, though, isn't it? It's like oh, and, oh this thing. It's like you're not you're not looking at the root. That yes. that problem is only going to get bigger. And yeah. you like you can shoot at it all you want, but it ain't going nowhere, and it's just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and eventually it's going to overwhelm you. So you can start doing something about it, realistic about it, mm. or you can just you know pretend that you're in control. But um, as someone, I'm really fascinated in how history evolves. You know, you and I read stories today, we have an opinion on it, and five years time we have more information, and ten years we have more information. People have different interpretations. Well, I'm fascinated when I'm in my older years to look back and see how we see this world when we say, well, you know, let, let's take a step back and say many of the people who are coming as immigrants to our countries are people who've been impacted by our economic and military interventions around the world over the last 20 or 30 years. We deliberately closed the legal routes that happened to this country and then said the problem is that they're coming over here on boats. And you go, fundamentally, we, we created many of these problems. We are a country that has historically been very kind to you know, people coming. That's, we're not always brilliant at it, but lots of stuff, but we're really terrible at it. But there are times where we have kind of been a place of, of sanctuary. We are now a multicultural country. Say, you, know, you can phrase it however you want, but when you look at how this country is made up, we are a country of immigrants and even not just over the last 30, 40 years. You know, you go back far enough, there's not many, you know, England is a country which has been invaded time and time and time again. Mm. My family came over from France in the 1500s. That's, that's huge in those. We had the Angles coming over with the Saxons. You know, it's a, historically it's a very short period of time, but the particular group of people who believe themselves to be British have lived on this island. 
And uh, I think a time will come, we'll look back and realize that we've done a really silly thing. And I hope that as the young people who I see every day, there'll be a part of saying, actually, we want to, rather than trying to worry about our sense of national identity and identify people who are different than us, the blame for the problems, we want to focus our energies on solving the real problems, which are facing humanity, climate change, mm. inequality, global hunger, you know, transnational crime, taxation. These are things that we should be solving. But that's it. Like the the thing at the end of the day is it's the rights, the rights, the identitarians, you know, it's like, oh, you, we, we want to dress up like beef eaters and, you know, do whatever. And it it's like you're stuck to these superstitious, like artificially created identities as a way of distracting yourself from just like looking at the facts and the problems and what needs to be done. And, you you know, you'd rather stick your fingers in in your ears than like look at the reality i mean that's not always the case but they, like the way it's presented in the media of the mm -hmm. you know this two sides and the the hysterics the hystericism of of it you yeah. know and it's i i worry that things that we worry about are symptoms not causes mm. And like I said a few times during this, I think as, as a society, we're going to have to realize that dealing with those causes will mean making some difficult decisions. Mm. Um, and I just hope that I live to see us making some of those difficult decisions and recognizing, but actually sometimes change is a good thing. Mm. Okay. That's a great point to go into the change question. So how are you doing for time? I realize. All right. Yeah, yeah, so I've nutted probably far too much, but so. no, uh, no, like we're gonna over. Well, I'm just asking because um, I don't know if I want to kind of run us through fast or or give you a bit more time on the questions, but and I think this is probably a, like if we don't cover it here, if we don't cover the strikes here, then I'll 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 get it in. Um, but yeah, I want to ask you about that, and so yeah, so we'll do the change question. Yeah. So thinking about your role or, or even work in general or work across the board, if there's any three things you could change about work or your work, what would you change? I, I want to start this by saying that the love I love about my work, I think that's a really important thing to say. I enjoy working in a place where I'm able to make a difference. There are lots of really positive things about working at the university in terms of current benefits. And especially having just spent three months in America where, you know, maternity leave might be a couple of weeks and you get like, you know, you get an, an, an annual sick leave accrual of, of pay. If you're going to be sick, you better wait until you've had your kind of five days for the year. There's lots that I love working about the University of Leeds. I, I think the first thing I would change is partly a national thing, but I think it's a specific University of Leeds thing as well, which is that like many people who work here, well, I'm going to call the public sector. And I think, I mean, like kind of quite broadly, and I think it's, it is a private sector as well, but we see that most in the teachers, nurses, police officers, university staff, civil servants. For a decade, we have been told we're in this world of low inflation. Things aren't getting that much more expensive. We can't afford to put up the salaries. And so we've seen a decade of real terms, pay cuts. My personal job, if you take the spine point I'm on, take what that was back in 2009 and just raise that inflation, my salary would be 10,000 pounds a year more mm. if it had kept up with inflation. And this mm. is a society where costs are skyrocketing, especially of, of housing. I have this conversation with my parents. Yes, their salaries were much lower when they started their jobs, but yeah, you know, you know that's first house was kind of three times his salary. Mm. Yeah. That would mean I'd be buying a house for a hundred thousand pounds. Mm. You can't buy a house for a hundred thousand pounds. It's just not possible. It's, mm. You might buy a really terrible flat in a not very nice area. Mm. Housing has got a lot more expensive, primarily because of the generation who come before us making a regular kind of proper enough house plan market rising. And also the inflation of a financial asset, because if, if, you know, mortgages had kept 
rates with, you know, a loaf of bread, they would be way less. Yeah. I, like I view it as, you know, you buy an expensive financial product and you get a free house that you can live in maybe for a while, if you're yeah. lucky. <laughs> and it's, you know, the, the house I live in now made minimum wage last year. Mm. It went up more than minimum wage. Mm. So we live in this world where I think like a lot of people, life has got more expensive. Any energy bills are soaring. Food costs are soaring. Mm. And we are kind of living in a pay crisis. And we're seeing an unprecedented level of nationwide strikes. Mm. But this is not just about what's happening this year. You can only understand, I think, the level of discontent that's being seen against the backdrop of 10 years of deliberate austerity and below inflation pay rises. Exactly. Now, we could get into the kind of, yeah, the economics of, well, this is what we have to do. And the reality is, I, there's a part of me that goes, that, that's no, not that my is, problem. No, and it's nonsense. It's like, yeah. what, you had to cut for 10 years to make savings. Where are these fucking savings then? And, you know, how, how is it that other countries' living standards have risen where ours has fallen? You know, without a... Yeah, a, a and uh, why has our mortality been falling since 2010? No. Yeah, why well, is life expectancy going down? Mm. Uh, and so we kind of... So I think the first thing I would change is a real genuine pay rise, but not just kind of a one-off real genuine pay rise, a kind of commitment both to, maybe we're not going to go back to 2009. The reality is, much as I would love my university to tell I'm going to raise everyone's salary to what they were in 2009, and here's another 10,000 pounds every year. I would be over the moon. And the reality is a lot of our money would pay back in taxation, in student loan payments. I would use it to buy things in shops and pay VAT to stimulate the economy. Um, I regularly suffer with a bad back and I have not for a while gone for a massage because I'm looking very closely at my finances because I'm doing some other bits of work on my house. There are things that I would spend on that would kind of benefit the wider economy. I don't think that's going to happen. What I would love to see is from the commitment both to kind of make an immediate step to recognize that we're in a cost of living crisis mm -hmm. and kind of a UK-wide commitment to we are going to find a way to ensure that salaries are keeping pace with inflation for the next uh, whatever it is because, uh, you know, for, especially for those people who are kind of, who are, who are workers, who are kind of on, I, I am on, I'm kind of apparently very close to what is the Yorkshire median salary. And I think, well, that's, it's great. And when I was a kid, it sounded like a lot of money, but actually the reality is these days, it's not a huge amount of money. Yeah. And when I think of colleagues, I'm a double, I am what apparently Generation Z called a, a dinky household. I'm a double income, no kids. I feel like kind of just about all right. But I look at friends who live in a single income household and they go, well, of course, I'm not going to be able to get a mortgage to save for a house until I have a family member who passes away. It's not an option. I had, I see colleagues who have to work two jobs, who have to go to food banks. And I just think it's absolute disgrace of what's going on in this country. Mm. And there's always a part of me that goes, and it's ironic because when we think about salary, it's always very kind of comparative. And there's always part of me that says, I wouldn't mind if those who were kind of below me had a much bigger pay rise than I did because they are the ones mm. who are struggling the most. And then you go, but there are people out there who are earning 10 times my salary. But then there are people out there who are earning millions of pounds a year and mm. they, they, they pay their tax via Guernsey and Jersey and Malta and not a penny. Well, they, don't, that, I guess, they don't pay their tax. Their yeah. domestic servants pay more than them. <laughs> yeah, you know, there, there, are, there are years where I have paid more tax than Donald Trump. Mm. Probably because, most years. Because he writes off his tax because of, you know, deductibles on his properties. Mm -hmm. and if you have enough money, you can find a way around it. So, you know, there's so many to do about that. But I think fundamentally, not just for me as an individual, for people who are workers, who have seen their real kind of spending power go down year on year. I think that's a problem we need to solve. Not just because it's a nice thing to do, but because when you look at some of the other problems we face in society that we've talked about today in terms of kind of Brexit and worrying political ideology, that comes from a sense of injustice. And if we're not tackling that injustice, where people are going to get angry and that anger can be directed by people who can sell snake oil and kind of say, this is, this is who your problem is, whether it's immigrants, whether it's trans people, whether it's whatever. The target is today, they will find something to say, this is what is causing your pain. And I, I genuinely think that if we don't do something to kind of tackle that, the unfairness that is becoming endemic in our society, in our country, we're going to find ourselves 
becoming more and more aggressive politically. And I think that's a very worrying place to go now. So that's the first thing, a real pay rise and a real sense of transparency. I think the second thing is a very specific university of Leeds thing. We were saying kind of just as we we're kind of getting set up for, we both kind of are involved in unions. I am involved in, in a trade union. Uh, my background is I was a student union officer when I graduated. Mm. And one of the things I love about the University of Leeds is its approach to partnership as a, I think a really strong and robust approach to saying students are experts in their own education. We should involve mm. them in decision making and trust our experience. And I love that. When I was a student union officer in North Wales, we just copied all of the stuff that Leeds did because we knew they were one of the best universities in the country. But, and I love that part of my job, I get to sit down with students and talk to them honestly and ask for their thoughts and ask for their ideas and mm. empower them and watch them grow. Mm. But I love that when there's a problem, the senior leadership for university sit down with student officers in Leeds University Union and say, how do we solve this together? Mm. But I do not see that partnership between the same people and the staff unions on campus. And there is a real problem at the University of Leeds. It has seen some of the longest strikes of staff of any university in the UK. It has seen some best attended strikes of any university in the UK. The union I am in in one month had more than a hundred people joining it. Mm. And the response of my university sadly has been to further crack down on and demonize workers. And we've seen at the, you know, recently over the last couple of weeks, attempts to say that staff who have to look after provide childcare because schools are closed, won't be able to take care of us. And staff who don't make up all of their teaching and learning activities that are taking place whilst we're on strike could be docked a hundred percent of pay. Mm. And it feels like there is an attempt to, what I'm not seeing as an attempt to say there is a problem here, recognize that we're going to sit down with staff, understand what the problem is. And whilst we recognize the, the, you know, the, the answer to the questions that are being asked and the problems that staff are seeing are mm. complex and multifaceted and do not have an easy answer we can just do. We will trust our staff and, the, and their unions who represent them to have those difficult conversations in the same way that we do with students. Because there isn't an easy answer to all this. Thank goodness I'm not the vice chancellor. I would probably start off by doing some stuff and it's very popular and be told, but I've done some stuff that's really going to screw up the university. It's a mm. difficult job and I'm glad I don't have it. But it feels like a conscious decision is being made to demonize the unions and to not treat staff in the same way that students are treated with partnership. And, mm. and I could talk about how I find that angry and frustrating, but ultimately it's disappointing. I, f I have such a love for the University of Leeds. I've had such wonderful experience here. I think it's a great mm. place, but I, th I feel like views have become entrenched. And I don't know what's going to change that. And I'm worried about that because the answer is either the university will blink and change its mind, in which case the damage is already done and we'll need to see real ongoing systemic commitment to listening to staff. Or staff will begin and say, we just cannot afford any more strike days. And then people will be bitter and angry and won't work above and beyond. And it'll be students who'll be impacted. Hmm. So yeah, genuine, meaningful engagement from the university to, uh, to its staff and to its staff unions. Hmm. And, and I kind of want to think there's some really good stuff that's going on. So the area I work in student education service. That there are some challenges. Leadership recently sat down and said, we're going to have some open conversations. Mm. And we're going to sit down and listen to you as frontline staff and find out what we need to do. And we can't promise it's going to change overnight, but we, we hear that we need to do more. And I just kind of go, let's see what you do. Judge you on your actions or your words, but this is yeah. exactly the right approach. Is you're, you're kind of treating us as the experts. You're giving us a chance. You recognize we're passionate about this and you're working with us. And that feels like a really good step. And I don't see that in the wider university. And obviously that's tied up with kind of pay and pensions and what the dispute is about. Mm. It's student, you know, the only leverage that we as staff have when there is a disagreement is to go out on industrial action and the only people who are acting are, who are impacted the students. I'm sorry, I find it really difficult to think. Well, and, the, and the staff impacted. that are on stray, oh, you, know yeah. I mean, you lose pay. But, but, but I make a decision to do that. Yeah. Students don't make that decision so, and they're, yeah. still, they're still paying. I've yeah. had some really interesting conversations with them in the last couple of weeks about the industrial action. And there are students who are obviously very bitter about having had a really difficult couple of years with, you know, there's been a lot of industrial action mm -hmm. and with COVID, they had a very different experience, but 
the students who I speak to fundamentally look at what the university is saying, what the unions are saying, what the students' union is saying, and they say, I don't understand why the university is treating staff the way it is. Hmm. So that's change number two. And those are the two that I'm really passionate about. So the third one, I'm going to take, going to take a bit of a curveball. I, part of my role, I'm a disability contact. I'm a real believer in making university accessible. And I think historically, we kind of, you know, have a particular view of what a graduate is and the skills that you need. And actually, I think we're increasingly realized that, you, you know, it, many of those attributes are not necessarily the most important. You could be, you can demonstrate your subject knowledge in a way that doesn't necessarily involve being excellent at exams or essays or presentations. And I think that this isn't necessarily, I'm kind of aware this isn't really about me and in my, in my job mm. and maybe there's kind of a mental health link and I'd be very lucky to have great mental health support. So I'll kind of tie that in, but we have students who struggle with their mental health. And I, I think that there is so much more we can do as society, as universities and as a university to ensure that the students who need that support get we have a really incredible team of uh, staff working in disability services who are so passionate about what they do. But we see the number of students who report to the university that they have a disability providing evidence rising year on year, and it is hard for that team to keep up with and ensure we're putting reasonable adjustments in place. Mm -hmm. We're seeing new reasonable adjustments coming in and there isn't kind of, you know, all staff training on how to support students with disability. And when we, when members of the disability services team come out and do training, it's really kind of inspirational and wonderful and really kind of great. And then it kind of hits the wall of, we only have so many hours a day. And, I, mm. and then we see students, you know, historically there was a time when, you know, you could apply for government funding if you thought you had dyslexia, get a dyslexia test. Um, mm. And then that was withdrawn. And now the university actually kind of announced a while ago it was going to support that. And I'm not seeing the details of that, but there's stuff we should be doing to better financially support students who are struggling because of kind of a disability and maybe kind of looking at some of a wider challenge in terms of, you know, people who've had BTECs where maybe they've had a different approach to studying than students who've done A-levels and how do we ensure that they're able to engage in it? And there's some good work that's going on. I think there's more we can do. And I guess that kind of comes ultimately to the fundamental question of what is a university? Is it about training people for jobs? Is it about a space where people can discover where they are? Is it about being a transformational space for knowledge exchange and information. I, I feel like there is more we can do there to have a better benefit for everyone. Yeah. Or is it a place where you buy job certificates? Yeah. And it's, <laughs> you know, Which, and you know as, as it gets more commercialized, it becomes more and more and the, you know, the student takes that more kind of, or, or the parents, whoever's paying for it, it's like, well, I've mm. paid for this. I want this. So that's I like that. Yeah. On. If I was a student paying fees, right? Obviously I'm a striker and I absolutely support the strikes. And I think we need to do it. And I really hope we see resolution. If I was a student right now, I would be complaining mm -hmm. and saying, I'm, you know, whether or not I like the model of, you know, commercialization that universities have had, I am paying or I'm accruing 9,000 pounds of debt a year. Mm -hmm. Why am I not getting the teaching that I've paid for? If I went to the co-op tomorrow and said, I'm going to buy 9,000 pounds worth of food. And they said, here's 8,000 pounds worth of food. I would go, oh, where's the rest of my food? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And we'll do UBI. If there was a UBI, if there was a universal basic income, how would that change things for you? Do you think you would still work or would you do less hours? Would it, would it change anything at all? Would you go off and start doing your dream job? Would you become a professional bicycle fundraiser? Uh, uh, so I'm going to slightly preface this because I think it's really important to do this and say, I, I'm not an expert in universal basic, basic mm -hmm. income. I've read a couple of newspaper articles about it and that is the limit of my knowledge. So I, mm -hmm. I think it's really important. We live in a world where it's very easy to profess to be an expert of things. And mm -hmm. I could profess to be an expert of governmental motorway policy in the 1940s and 1950s. I cannot profess to be an expert <laughs> in this. <laughs> I think what I would probably note is we live in a world where one of the threats that I think we see, and we've talked about some of the big global challenges we have, but one of the big threats we see to working life is the rise of automation, the rise of AI in a way that kind of is historically often painted as liberating workers, reducing menial jobs, creating more high paid jobs, 
Mm. At the time where we see more badly paid jobs, more, you know, people who are working in, in Amazon, you know, I was reading really statistic the other day that kind of in America workers in Amazon, more industrial, you know, double the rate of industrial actions than any other warehouse in America. So I think for me, we have this kind of fundamental problem where maybe there aren't enough jobs. There are a lot of jobs that actually are very menial and people are being pushed on and there's an unfairness there. So for me, if we were looking at UBI, you know, I'm, I'm not going to kind of laze around and retire. I, I, I love my job. I want to do it. I would be really intrigued to see how this would interrelate with some of the trials we see going on about why is a working week Monday to Friday? Why is it five days? And what I think would be really interesting to see would, would be, would it allow more people to have three or four day working weeks and to have more time to pursue other activities? So for example, I'm, I've done charity fundraising. Would it allow me to do, you know, go and shake a bucket in town every now and again? I'm chair of a community group. Would it allow me to better mobilize volunteers to kind of improve local footpaths and to campaign for safe places to walk and cycle. What could I do with that time? So my gut feeling without knowing all the details would be how could we leverage this to allow us to do more. And even if that's as simple as having time to relax and look after ourselves and do positive things for our well-being, I think that would be a very positive investment in our mental health and our well-being as, as a nation. So that I think is what I would do. I, 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 I'm very lucky to get a sense of purpose from work. I love my job. There's lots I'm really passionate about. I wouldn't kind of pack it all in, but I would look at kind of maybe having a better balance of, of work and life, mm. which I think has really been the theme of our whole conversation. Mm. Mm. It's almost like yeah. I planned that answer and didn't just stumble on it at the very end of a conversation. But so, sometimes it works like that, you know, um, you know, but it's, it's that formulating your thoughts thing, isn't it? And sometimes your thoughts are a lot more formulated than you think and are quite succinct. And then other times you think, oh, I know this. I know, I know my opinion. And you start talking about it and you're like, mm. I, I don't know what I'm talking about here. I thought <laughs> this made sense in my head. <laughs> okay. So this is the point where I throw it over to you. So, um, if there's anything that we haven't covered that you want to cover or anything you want to flag up. I kind of feel like I've covered all of the little bits I was thinking wouldn't it's be nice. It's quite, I... it's quite comprehensive, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, we, we, that's for a little while. I, I guess I kind of want to just reflect on two little things we've talked about today. Yeah. I mean, what is the importance of work-life balance mm. and the importance of recognizing that in a kind of complete irony on the podcast that it's purely about kind of you know, what we do for work, there is so much out there outside of work. And just kind of encouragement for people to identify the things that they love doing, that they enjoy doing, that make them happy and to do more of that. Mm. And then I think the second thing is to kind of take a reflection, you know, whenever I talk about America, I'm kind of really lucky to be in a world where people tell me, well, it say to me, you've done such a great thing, you've done an inspirational thing. I can't imagine doing that. You did such a wonderful thing. And I kind of go, well, I, I'm not some extraordinary person. I'm not this kind of person who's been you know, specifically bred and trained to be an inspirational human being. I'm just a guy who had a mental health breakdown and said, I want to go and do something that's really stupid. Mm. Uh, let's see if I can do it. And I fundamentally believe that each and every one of us, A, as human beings to the people who we see are kind and loving and not, we, we see, we've talked a lot about today about kind of differences of opinion and kind of hatred and how kind of people can get really entrenched. But I think fundamentally you sit two people down in a room and you know, there will be more that they have in common than they don't. Mm -hmm. And I think certainly we as individuals are all capable of incredible things. And when I think about my journey, metaphorically and literally, there is not everyone out there has things they dream of doing. Everyone out there has things they can do that can change the world. And I just hope if anyone's kind of reflecting on this and thinking about what they want to do with, with their working life, with their personal life, that they recognize that they are capable of more than they believe, and they can go on and do incredible things. And sometimes incredible things happen when you say yes and do something that feels ridiculous. And you meet people and you talk to people. And you know, if I hadn't done this bike ride, 
we probably wouldn't be having this conversation right now. So that's a human connection, but would not have happened if I hadn't done that and just thought, oh, I like talking about this, right? Because it's nice for me to relive the really good days when I'm just living in survival mode at the moment. Yeah. So yeah, just kind of a reflection on a few of the themes that have come up today.